Seated. When I was in rabbinical school, I was davening in a shul in Riverdale, and somebody came up to me and said, I hear you're in rabbinical school. I think you should join the Chever Kedisha. Chever Kedisha, as you may know, is a group of people who prepare a deceased for burial. It's done in a very beautiful way. In fact, uh, after I had been on the Hever Kedisha for a long time, uh, it dawned on me that it was the exact same procedure that readied a person for burial as when you get a child ready for bed. It dawned on me because I had a little boy at the time, Dadi, and uh, one night I was called to do a uh, the work of the Hever Kedisha, and I was called just after I had finished putting Adi to bed. And so what I had done was given him a bath, <coughs> clipped his nails, put him in his pajamas, and then laid him down to rest for the evening. And then I went to do the work of the Heber Kedish and did the exact same thing. And I remember it very clearly the first time that I was involved in the work of the Heber Kedish. I stood at the door and watched from afar and didn't participate at all in the process. But then as time went on, I got closer to the action, so to speak, and became involved in the actual work. Some days I was assigned to reciting the prayers, and some I was assigned to the washing, and sometimes to the cleaning, and sometimes putting on the tachrichim, which we refer to as the shroud. But when people ask me about it, I never call it that. I call it footsie pajamas because in fact, that's exactly what it is. Shroud makes it seem so scary, but footsie pajamas makes it seem so loving. And that in fact really is what the job of the Heber Kedisha was. And I remember so clearly that work. And one of the gentlemen who was in charge said to me, I know that you're doing this for the experience. And I know you're doing it just for a little bit of time so that you can speak from a place of knowledge when you consult with people as they ready their family members when you become a rabbi. But you're really good at it and I think you should stay on the Hever Kedisha. And so I did for many years. And he said to me, I remember so clearly, it was 35 years ago, he said to me, you know, not everyone can do this work, but you can and therefore you should. He was saying this ought not be just an experience, but it's something that should be part of my life because I could do it. So many people can't do it. It's difficult work, not physically, but emotionally. It's straining. And not everybody has the ability to do it. The work of handling with love and care a deceased, maybe someone you never even knew, is difficult emotional work. And it reminds me so clearly of the work that happened in this morning's parsha. just to remind you. In this morning's parsha, there is a moment in which Aaron's two, so two of Aaron's sons die, Nadav and Avihu. And Moses, in this tragic moment, is trying to figure out what to do and what to say. He says to Aaron, Vayomer Moshe Aaron, who asher diber Adonai. Moses speaks to Aaron the words that he believes came from the Almighty. Bikarov akadesh ve'el pnei kol ha'am achabed. That through those near to God, God shows God's self. And Aaron's response to only the good die young is Vayidoma Haron. Aaron was silent. And it reminded me of this moment in rabbinical school when my professor, Rabbi David Kogan, who was teaching practical rabbinics, said, never talk philosophy at a funeral. Makes no sense. And that's why Moses' comment to Aaron was, basically meaningless. And that's why Aaron has no response for him. And so Moses says, I've got to do something in this moment. And so he calls out, Vayikra Moshe el Mishael ve'el el Tzafon b'nei Uziel, Doda Haron v'yomer lehem kirvu se'u 
Achechem me'et p'nei HaKodesh el mechutz l'machanei Moshe called out to Mishael and El Tzafan. And he says to them, only you, because you're priests as well, can go into the Holy of Holies where Nadav and Avihu had died. Only you can go in there and retrieve their bodies and take them outside. The strangeness about this request is not the request itself, but who is tasked with this job? Mishael and El Tzafon, we never hear of them before except in a lineage, and we never hear of them again. Only they, in that moment, were selected for that job. Two people who make a singular appearance in the Torah and just do the right thing at the right time, and so they are called out by name. We have so many people, if you look through the Torah, who are never named in the Torah. They are the sister of so-and-so, or the son of so-and-so, or the daughter of so-and-so, but they're never called out by name. But these two, Mishael and El Tzafon, are called out, and I think it's because they have to do something that is so difficult to do, and the Torah is teaching an important lesson. Not everyone can do that sort of job. It's not heroic, it's not even physically difficult, but it's certainly something that only a few can do. Judah Lo ben Bitzalel, known as the Maharal of Prague, in his commentary known as the Gur Aryeh, teaches us, Shalol Arbev Hasimcha, Kish Adam Sha'amar Avar Lamet Milifnealacha. You don't mix joy and sadness together. Someone has to be tasked with taking the deceased out so that the community can go on celebrating, says the Gur Ayyad. Not everybody can do it, but somebody is tasked with tending to those who are no longer with us so that the community can go on, so it can continue to celebrate the joyful moments. The Maharal of Prague is teaching something extraordinarily poignant. Life isn't always a bed of roses. Life isn't always easy or pleasant. And that life can be filled with hardships and challenges alongside all of the positive experiences. Life is difficult and confronting those challenges isn't, isn't for everyone. And depending on the circumstance, any one of us might shy away from the difficult tasks before us in life. You know the very famous statement of Pirkei Avot, Bimkom She'en Ish Hishtadel Hiyot Ish, where there is no person, strive to be that person. In a place where there are difficult things to be done, strive to be that person, but recognize you won't always be able to be. Not everyone can step up. Not everyone can decide it is their moment. Some seek out greatness. Some want to leave their mark. Some want to be remembered for something. Some are always trying to prove their worth and their value. And then there are the unsung heroes. When I sat down to write this sermon, I swore to myself this week, I wasn't going to reference the war in Israel. I've been doing so every week that I have preached for the last six months. But it's hard because the war is always in my stream of consciousness. A month into the war, I've spoken almost every week about the war. The war that doesn't even need a name even though you should know there are about 150 wars going on in the world right now. They're just not wars in Syria and Ukraine and Israel and Gaza. There are so many others, like Myanmar, with an estimated 13,000 casualties in just the year 2022. Ethiopia has a violent war that's going on since November of 2020. Yemen has a civil war that's been going on since September 2014. The Congo has a terrorist insurgency. Afghanistan, a civil war and a terrorist 
insurgency as well. Mexico has a drug war that has left 350,000 dead. People are fighting wars all over the world, and we don't know a single one of their names. Rachel Gottlieb, only one month into the war in Israel, wrote, there is a unit in the Israeli army that is, for lack of a better term, the extraction unit. As in the job of the soldiers is to take the casualties The job is to take the casualties and, God forbid, fallen soldiers from the battlefront and transport them to safety. It makes sense, she writes, to think about it. Combat soldiers are busy fighting. The guys in tanks are lumbering around making noise. Reconnaissance soldiers are sneaking around doing their thing. So someone has to be in charge of taking out the soldiers who are injured. They have to find their way back to safety and that is a someone in that unit. That's their job. They do it quietly, without fanfare. I don't know, she says, what that unit is called, but I have a name that I've decided to use for them. Even if they don't have a title, I call them, she says, heroes. I'm not say, saying that each and every one of us should take up a we weapon and stand to post. But we can do our own part, even if we don't get any recognition. For some of us, we do this work for our congregation all of the time. Life, you see, isn't just about the happy times, and it certainly isn't just about the sad times. But when the sad times come, and most certainly they will, no one is immune and that's why there is a group in our congregation that steps up every time to show our care, to show our concern, to show our love, to show our support because of this group in our congregation who meets every month just to go through a list of people to make sure that everyone who needs to be touched gets touched. And we thank Sheila for leading that group. It's called the Caring Community. We don't say, I wish I could pay a shiva call, but that's not my thing. Today I conclude with one of my favorite readings from the High Holidays. It's a reading that was translated, but written originally by a Ukrainian woman named Zelda from the Ukraine, from the Ukraine, obviously. And this is her poem that we read every High Holiday. Each of us has a name given by God and given by our parents. Each of us has a name given by our stature or our smile and given by what we wear. Each of us has a name given by our sins and given by our longing. Each of us has a name given by us, by our enemies and given by our love. Each of us has a name given by our celebrations and given by our work. Each of us has a name given by the seasons and given by our blindness. And so I say to you this morning, this is your moment. So choose your name. Shabbat Shalom. We continue with Musaf, page 184, Chati Kaddish. Please rise. <laughs> 